Hello, Hopkinton. Welcome to HCAM Studios for a session of the ongoing series of Veterans Remember. I'm Hank Alessio, sitting in for the ill Dick Gooding, your regular host. Not to worry, though, Dick will be back with us shortly. Veterans Remember has given us an opportunity to visit with men and women from the Hopkinton area who have served in the military. The discussions have included experiences in a wide time frame of history, from World War II to the recent Gulf conflicts. All branches of service have been involved, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, even the Merchant Marines, and in times of conflict as well as peacetime, when the war was cold. Content has been keenly newsworthy. With it, we're hoping to build a Hopkinton treasure for your grandchildren to benefit from the historic perspectives and insights on how the military can potentially shape one's life in a strongly positive way. We intend to keep this momentum. Today's guest is a Hopkinton original, a lifer, born, raised, and lived here. Davison Welch is known by many and I've come to realize, related to virtually everyone in town. He's here to share his story with us. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are. Davison, welcome. Thank you. Well, it's always uh, easier to start at the beginning. You well, were born I, in Hopkinton. I was born in Hopkinton uh, in uh, uh, 1920, uh, which gives away my age. And I graduated from Hopkins High in 1938. And uh, in 1938, there were rumblings about a war in Europe. Just rumblings, of course, that uh, they predicted there was going to be a major war in Europe. So uh, all of us getting out of high school were figuring that we'd be going into the service. And in 1941, uh, I graduated from uh, art school in Boston. And uh, I, I graduated there in May, and uh, a month or so later, I went to uh, work at Lombard Governor in Ashland, which was a war plant, as they referred to them then. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, they made uh, small parts, not really a major item, although uh, one of their uh, contracts was with the uh, uh, boat company uh, in Groton, Connecticut. Mm. And uh, they uh, made the uh, boats that uh, John Kennedy uh, uh, drove, had. And, uh, they also made parts for Jones and Lamson in uh, uh, Maine uh, that had uh, war cr uh, contracts too. So I uh, uh, worked for Lombard uh, for about a year and uh, then uh, of course the war was uh, in full swing then and uh, I had been deferred as a uh, uh, manager, uh, production manager at Lombard, but uh, I knew the deferment wasn't going to continue and I wasn't really interested in staying there. And I didn't want to go into the Army, I wanted to go into the Air Force. So I went down to Boston and I uh, uh, registered to uh, get into the Air Force and I was accepted. But they told me, uh, if your number comes up in the draft, Prior to the time you're called by the Air Force, you'll have to go. Oh. So my number did come up, and uh, I did go, and I went into the Air Force. They, they told me at the time I would go into whatever uh, department needed men the most, and the Air Force needed them at the time. So I went to, into the Air Force, and I... Uh, uh, went to basic training uh, at Atlantic City and we lived in hotels and we marched from one hotel to another to go to Chow and to take exams and there uh, I took aptitude exams uh, which would show uh, uh, what I might be eligible for 
And uh, of course, everybody says artists are, are not mechanically inclined, but I found I passed all the mechanical tests. I could have been a mechanic, a radio operator, or I could go into gunnery. And uh, I chose gunner, gunnery uh, for two reasons. I, uh, when I was uh, uh, marching in Framingham to go to the train, I bumped into a fellow by the name of Russ Phipps. And my, I'm a Phipps, my grandmother was a Phipps, so we got talking and found out that we were related. And uh, so he was interested in, uh, in gunnery and armament. And we also heard uh, via the grapevine that uh, Denver, Colorado was a great place to be. And that's where we would be shipped. We'd be sent to Lowry Field in Denver, Colorado. So that's where I went. Now, before you went to Denver, wasn't there someone else down in Atlantic City that was close to you? My wife came down. To, she wasn't my wife then, but she came down to visit me. And uh, uh, we stayed in hotels. And uh, there was a civilian hotel right next to the military one where I was stationed. And uh, of course, drawing has always entered into everything for me. and. Uh, so uh, the duty sergeant saw me drawing uh, little cartoons to put in my uh, mail. I illustrated my letters. And he said, could you illustrate one of those for me? So I said, sure. So I said, you just write what you want, leave me the spaces and I'll illustrate them. So I did that and uh, I mean, nothing was said about duty, but it just seemed to happen that when my name came up for KP, I was never on the KP list. <laughs> so <laughs> he did me favors. So my, uh, I, I was on guard duty, though, occasionally, and my wife, her only chance to visit with me was to come and stand while, and we could talk. I might not be able to move, but I could talk. So uh, uh, we talked at uh, Atlantic City. And uh, then she, uh, when I was out in Denver, Colorado, uh, she uh, came out to see me in Denver. Be before we get to Denver, Davison, is this uh, something like what you might have been doing to illustrate those letters? No, this is what I did to illustrate the uh, books where I worked. In okay, the, we'll in get to the, that later. Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay, yeah, sorry. I did that there. I did, no, these were, uh, uh, I can't really remember the subject much, but they were things that he was interested in telling his folks at home. Mm -hmm. And he'd tell me what they were and I'd sketch them in the space. And, uh, but then again, when I did get to uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, uh, I knew the, uh, uh, what was he? I guess he's in the Department of Transportation, Bill Curley. Uh, and uh, he arranged for all of my wife's trip. He, he got it all taken care of and where they'd meet and what train she'd take and all of this. And Russie Phipps's wife went with her. And uh, they had it all arranged at Chicago. Uh, before the uh, gate opened, someone came out and invited them to come in first. So uh, they got through the gate first, and right after they got through, Russie's wife uh, her, uh, dropped her suitcase, and all the clothes fell out <laughs> all over the railroad <laughs> ramp. So, but then, uh, she came out there, and, and again, I, I couldn't see her very much. I just guess I got a weekend pass to see her. But uh, we, uh, I, I was stationed out there uh, for a while, and it seems as though I always got left behind. When I went to uh, Denver, Devon's in the first place, uh, I had a terrible reaction to shots, and uh, I got left behind. So I was shipped all by myself and later on when I was in Denver and I took the gunnery course and uh, learned to disassemble a, a 50 caliber machine gun with a 10 penny nail and uh, 
But uh, just before I, after I graduated, I got pneumonia and wound up in the hospital in Denver. So again, I got left behind. My outfit got shipped out. And I, got, I was sent out with about eight other fellows. Before we get on that uh, train, didn't you have an interesting story about the 50 caliber tests that you had to go yes, through? Yes, I did. Uh, the uh, fellow ahead of me, what they did was uh, give us a final test. They built in a malfunction into the 50 caliber. And your job was to find the malfunction and correct it. Well, uh, they always told you to stand aside when you opened the back of the gun because it had a spring in it. If that came out, it could go right through you. So you had to stand aside and release the spring. So that's what I had to do. That was the malfunction in my gun. But the fellow ahead of me uh, was from Massachusetts, and I don't remember his name. But he happened to get the malfunction, which was called a runaway gun. <laughs> and it would start firing and you couldn't stop it. It just kept firing. Well, the minute he tried it out and it started firing, he passed out right on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the only thing I remember about him. I don't remember his name. I just knew he came from Massachusetts. Mm. But uh, anyway, because I... Uh, was left behind. I was only one of six or eight that was sent by train. And of course, in those days, you didn't know where you were going. Everything was so secret. So I seemed to travel all over the country, uh, going to, from Denver to Florida. But I do know, we remember, I remember we stopped in uh, Chicago for a few minutes. And uh, we stopped in the uh, Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri. And, uh, but then I wound up uh, at Jacksonville at the railroad station, and uh, uh, I didn't have anything particularly in common with the other six, seven fellows that were with us. But when I got to the railroad station, I happened to sit next to a GI, and we got talking, where are you from, and that sort of thing, and we seemed to hit it off. And, and uh, he had an idea that he was going to go to McDill Field in Florida, and that's where I was going. So, but uh, a truck came and picked me up, and I went with a group to uh, McDill, and a different truck, of course, came and picked him up, and I didn't know whether he went to McDill or not. But later on, uh, when I got to uh, Florida, uh, I wasn't assigned any place because I was uh, just with a small group. Before we get to Florida, Davison, uh, and I'm going to take you back to Denver, and I want to link in your artistic work. Didn't you do some work in Denver? Uh, yes, art -wise? I did. Yes, I did artwork everywhere I went. <laughs> yeah, I always did artwork, and uh, so uh, that that followed me wherever I was. The stationery. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I did the stationery. That was due to uh, another buddy that I uh, knew. Uh, how did I know him? I guess he was in the same outfit. He wasn't in the same barracks, but Bill Sosnov. And uh, when he saw my artwork, he said, you ought to try to sell this. So he says, I'll make some phone calls. So he called the Butler Paper Company. And uh, I went out and showed them what work I had done. And uh, they were interested. And uh, got to know the sales manager and his family. And uh, they took me up uh, in the mountains skiing. and. Uh, got to know that family well and uh, anyhow uh, what I eventually sold was the uh, uh, a set of stationery uh, showing uh, it was called Yankee Pranks and it's showing uh, mm -hmm. the uh, the envelopes yeah showed the Americans chasing the Japs all over the place <laughs> and uh, the pages yeah those are the ones yeah. And uh, altogether, I, I've forgotten what I got. I've forgotten whether I got 50 cents a pack or what it was, but I wound up getting about $500, which in those days was not bad. 
So mm -hmm. when you could buy something, a loaf of bread for 10 cents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, uh, I did get to know that family and, uh, and they were very good to me. And uh, so now we can uh, go to Florida. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I met this fellow uh, at the Jacksonville at the uh, at the uh, train station, and uh, then of course when we left, I uh, I didn't know I'd bump into him again. But when I got to Florida, I was, we were all assigned an airplane, and the air we were supposed to service the guns. Uh, 50 caliber machine guns on that airplane. But when I got there, there's no airplane. So what they do is drive you out in a truck every day, way out onto the runway. They had a, a hard stand where the plane was supposed to be, and we'd go out there every day. And uh, so finally, uh, somebody suggested that we put up a volleyball net. And that's where I learned to play volleyball, is out there on the hard stand. But on rainy days or certain other days, we wouldn't go out there. And we'd sit around uh, in the uh, hangar uh, studying tech reports, which were real boring. And the sergeant in charge uh, uh, said to me one day and to one of the other fellows, uh, you know, it's an awful waste of time for you to be sitting here and doing nothing. He said, every day some opportunity to go to a school comes across my desk. And he said, I'd suggest that you follow my advice and go to these schools. It'll get you some points and uh, you'll learn something and it'll widen your, your knowledge. And uh, so I went to turret maintenance school, and I went to bomb rack school, and I went to two or three other schools. But it was interesting when I went to uh, turret maintenance school, uh, the final test was to take a ball turret apart and put it back together again. And uh, they, they said that uh, the way they operated, they had teams of two. You had to choose a partner. Well, I looked around and there's the fellow from the uh, Jacksonville Railroad Station. So he recognized me and I recognized him and we decided to team up. And it was a smart move on my part because he was very smart. And uh, we had no trouble at all mm -hmm. assembling and disassembling mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, and, and it was timed. You were supposed to see who could do it the most quickly. Mm -hmm. And there was one thing that you couldn't predict, and that was the uh, starter motor uh, on the belt feed that belt uh, that fed the ammunition into the, the 50 caliber. But the way you could tell whether it was right or wrong is that when you started it up, a little cloud of smoke would come out if you're wrong. So then you immediately knew how to change it. So we were so far ahead of the other students that we were able to change it and get it operating again and still won the contest. We, we did it faster than any of the others. But you, came, you became a, an instructor yourself, didn't you? Came out. Uh, an instructor yourself, yes, didn't you? Yes. Uh, after, uh, uh, yeah, oh, after that, uh, I went to work for uh, Captain Macklin. I had a, a drawing on the back of my uh, uh, jacket, and of very similar to the one that I, I did on the uh, Yankee pranks. It was a, a Jap in a plane chasing, I mean an American chasing a Jap. And uh, so I was walking along one day and the fellow said to me, did you draw that? And I said, yes I did. He said, I want to introduce you to Captain Macklem. He says, we, we run a, a gunnery school and we need artists. And uh, he said, the, the, I'm the only artist there and I need help. So he took me down and introduced me to Captain Macklin, and uh, I was transferred to the gunnery school. Well, after I got there, the adjutant in the outfit I was in uh, called me in and uh, gave me the devil because I never let him know that I was an artist. <laughs> and of course, my uh, 
I was listed as a gunner and an armorer. And uh, I, he said he had an artist that was doing a mural in his day room and they could have used my help. So anyway, I didn't take it too seriously. I worked in the gunnery school. And yeah, in that picture, Captain Macklin mm -hmm. is on the far right. And, and where are you in this, Davison? Uh, I'm right there. One, two, three, fourth from the left. Fourth from the left. And uh, uh, I had uh, a friend, Bill Rents, who was, uh, he's the second one from the left. And uh, he was, uh, he taught along with me, and, but he wanted to uh, transfer uh, to uh, North Carolina uh, to a, uh, uh, a smaller plane. We had uh, B-29s at that time. We started off with B-17s, with B-26s, uh, then 29s, and then uh, finally, uh, uh, finally the 29. And uh, I did my artwork through all those things, and one of the things I had done was uh, a positional uh, drawing. There were very few drawings of the B-29 at that particular tw time. And uh, so they uh, uh, had me do a drawing of the B-29 inside with each gunner position and the pilot's position and the entire crew. And Evidently, that was the only drawing of that kind of the B-29 at that time. So, anyway, I'm getting ahead here, but I was, uh, uh, I did get sent uh, by Captain Macklin uh, to instructor school. Uh, all of us as instructors had been trained in either the 50 caliber machine gun or the sights or bombs or bomb racks but we hadn't been trained as instructors. So now the uh, Air Corps decided they wanted the, all their instructors to have teacher training. So I went to this uh, Central Instructor School in uh, Fort Myers, and uh, it was over Christmas, and uh, I was married by then. I got married in, in Florida at the base chapel. and. Uh, so uh, I wanted to go home for Christmas, and the rule was they'd give you a test. If you passed the test, you didn't have to take gunnery school. And uh, as an armor, armor, I'd been pretty well trained in the gunnery anyway. So uh, uh, I went to gunnery school, and I also went there with uh, Sergeant Petrus, who was right next to the captain. and. Uh, he, here he is right here, this is third from the right. And uh, uh, he, was a, uh, he was a staff sergeant. And uh, when I uh, got to take the test, uh, I had been teaching aircraft recognition. You had to know the wingspans of the airplanes. And I knew them inside out. I knew all the airplanes. And uh, the sergeant, uh, taught gunnery and sighting, but he didn't teach the airplanes. He didn't know the wingspans of the airplanes. So I passed the test, test with flying colors. I got them all right, because I knew all of the wingspans, and he didn't get any of them right. So uh, I got letters from the other uh, enlisted men at the school congratulating me. Not that they didn't like him, he was a nice guy, but they just got a kick out of it that I was a PFC and he was a staff sergeant. I passed it and he didn't. So, well, yeah. but fortunately I, I did get back for Christmas. As we wrap up, Davison, uh, maybe the folks would uh, like to understand how your artwork in the military helped you after the military and how your assignments changed when the war ended. Yes, well, we only I, have uh, a couple of minutes. Of course, it, it helped me greatly because when I went into the service, uh, I didn't have any kind of an art assignment. As I say, I was in gunnery. I chose that myself. And, but I was fortunate enough in every position I was in, even when I was learning uh, uh, T-34 
teacher training uh, at the Central Instructor School, I was able to use my cartoons in my instructor, in my instructions. And uh, the people in charge liked that because there was, it brought some originality to the teaching. And uh, then everywhere I went in the service, especially in this uh, school, I had opportunities to draw the airplanes and as I say, to do that diagram. But one thing that happened was that uh, uh, Captain Macklin put me up for st staff sergeant. I was a sergeant then. And uh, it was turned down, my promotion. And he said to me, uh, uh, do you have any enemies or anybody that you know would vote against you? And uh, I said, well, I don't think so. But then he named the uh, adjutant who was irritated with me because I didn't tell him I was an artist, and he turned me down. So I had my chance to retaliate. The day I got out of the service, I had a telephone call to call this officer. And he didn't remember who I was, but I remembered who he was. And uh, he asked if I would send him a copy of that diagram I made of the B-29. and. For a minute, I thought, you know, I could tell him to go to hell, I'm a civilian, but I don't want to stoop as low as he was, and so I sent him the copy. Mm -hmm. And I'm always glad I made that decision. Well, we're out of time, Davison, and it's been a great session. I'm interested to see how civilian work and military work can coexist so nicely, and it sounds like you had wonderful experiences. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I've changed departments several times. My roommates have always been trouble. Now, because of the economy, I've had to move back home. When my mom gets drunk, she tells me everything I do is going to fail. I get into arguments with her about her drinking. Dad goes to Al-Anon family groups. I didn't think Al-Anon would work for me, but every time I go, I feel better. If someone's drinking bothers you, you might find help in an Al-Anon family group meeting right here in our community. I found support there. You can too. Call 1-888-4-AL-ANON or visit alanonfamilygroups.org.